Okay, guys, ready for chapter 10 of the enormous egg? We've got last time the world found out, and boy, they were getting a crowd in their little town of freedom. So let's see what happens. Well, the crowds kept gathering that way for almost a week, but after that, it began to quiet down a little. The Freedom Sentinel had never sold so many copies before, and Pop had to run through a second printing of about 2,000 copies to keep up with all the visitors. The grocery store ran out of ice cream and soft drinks every day except Thursday, then when we had a thunderstorm in the middle of the afternoon. By Saturday, things had calmed down again. There were just one or two people at a time now, mostly scientists from way off somewhere like Wisconsin or Kentucky that couldn't get here any sooner. One very dignified looking man with a big beard came all the way from Toronto, Canada. He stood looking up at Uncle Beasley for the longest time. Finally, he turned to Dr. Zemer and said, I say I do believe you're right. When I first heard the news, I thought you American paleontologists have gone off half-cocked about this. But I must say I've been quite convinced. White. Uh, you must be Kennedy from the National Museum. No, I'm Zemer. And you're from Toronto, you said? Yes, Morrison's the name. Dr. Zemer looked awfully pleased. Why, Professor Morrison, he said, I'm very happy to see you. It was very good of you to come. You know, I must admit I've had my doubts about whether this really is a dinosaur. But if you agree, then I'm not going to worry anymore. Professor Morrison smiled. You know, Zemer, I'm curious about what you plan to do with this amazing specimen. Will you be able to take good care of them? I'm never sure what you Americans may do with valuable things like this. You're all super, such super businessmen over here that I shouldn't all be all that surprised if you sold this animal to Hollywood or used it to advertise a Frankfurter stand. You will be careful of it, won't you? You better to speak to the owner, Dr. Zemer pointed to me. Nate Twitchell, this is Professor Albert Morrison, the world's greatest authority on dinosaurs. So you're the owner, Professor Morrison said, and his eyes sort of twinkled as he talked to me. My boy, you have the most remarkable creature here. It's very precious to us all, and it's precious because it's alive. Remember that, won't you? I hope you'll do everything you can to keep it alive. Yes, sir, I said, I will. Good boy, Professor Morrison said. I know we can count on you. Later that afternoon, I sat down under the maple tree in the yard to see what the newspaper had to say about Uncle Beasley. I've been so busy the last few days, I hadn't had a chance. This is what the New York Times had said. Live dinosaur hatched from hen's egg. Freedom, New Hampshire, August 4th. Scientists from all over the country are flocking to the little town of Freedom to see their first living dinosaur, which hatched recently from a hen's egg on the farm of Nathan Twitchell. Just how this animal whose race has been extinct for millions of years could have hatched from a hen's egg is unexplained. Paleontologists have gathered here from New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, and elsewhere over the United States, and they all agree that it is actually a dinosaur of the type known as Triceratops, a grass-eating reptile with three horns and a great bony collar over its neck. The species of dinosaurs known to have reached the length of more than 20 feet, weighing 10 tons when fully grown. I heard someone walking up the path, so I put down the paper. There was a man in a blue shirt carrying his coat over his arm. Hello, Mac, he said. Is this the place with the dinosaur? Yep, I said. Your name Nathan Twitchell? Yep. Ken. I look at the dinosaur? Sure, I said, and led him out to Uncle Beasley's pen. Uncle Beasley was asleep, stretched out on his side in the sunshine. You sure he's alive? Sure is. You see him breathing? The man nodded. My name's Bill Griner. I got a gas station up to Conway, and I heard about this dinosaur you got down here. I got to think that would be a swell thing to have in a cage outside my gas station. The stations are all go doing that now. They got bears, a raccoon, or maybe a monkey. It's good for business. People stop and buy gas at a place that's got animals. Now, if I had this dinosaur up there, I'd put a big sign, only living dinosaur in the world, and just about everybody would stop to see it and buy gas. See what I mean? I nodded. I saw what he meant, all right, but somehow I didn't take to the idea. Well, now, how much do you want for him? The man said. I'd be willing to give you a good price. Oh, no, thanks, I said. I want to keep him. But look, kid, I'm offering you real money. You got no use for a dinosaur, and you got all the work taking care of him and feeding him all that. Just let me take him off your hands, and you can make a nice profit on him. What do you say? I just don't want to sell him, I said. But what's the sense of that, kid? What good is it to you? 
It's too ugly for a pet and there's no market for dinosaurs these days. And it's going to be a big expense to feed it during the winter. But I said I wanted to keep him, I told the man, but I don't see it. He said, looking kind of annoyed at me, you're not using it for anything and I can make good money on it. Why don't you let me have it? But I just want to keep it. Isn't that all right if I just want to have it? Do I have to have a reason for everything? The man shrugged his shoulders and turned away. Well, okay, kid, have it your own way. But if you change your mind, let me know. Here's my address. He gave me a slip of paper and walked back to his red pickup truck. He raced the engine a few times, spun the truck around, and zoomed up, off up the street, leaving a big cloud of dust. Almost every day, there'd be, there'd be somebody who wanted me to sell Uncle Beasley to him for some reason or another. A great big yellow convertible drove up one time, and a smooth-looking man with a little bit of a black mustache got out. He started to offer me a cigarette from a silver cigarette case, but then he changed his mind, I guess. Does Nathan Twitchell live here, he asked. I told him yes. Is he home? Yep. Well, run along and tell him I'd like to speak with him on business. He turned away and didn't pay more attention to me, as if he was a king or something. I was just there to run errands for him. I didn't like his high-handed manner too much, so I just stood there. Pretty soon, he turned around and frowned at me. Didn't I tell you I wanted to speak with Mr. Nathan Twitchell? He said, don't waste my time, young man. You are speaking to him. I said, I'm Nathan Twitchell. He changed his manner then. Oh, he said, I, I understand you're the owner of the live dinosaur. Well, I'm the vice president of the Old Mill Pond Whiskey Corporation. I have a little proposition for you. I like to rent your dinosaur for a while so we can use it in our big advertising campaign. I didn't see what a dinosaur had to do with whiskey, so I finally asked him about it. Well, why it's perfect obvious, he said. What's the most important thing about any whiskey? I wasn't too sure about that, not having had any. The taste, the way it tastes, I said, not at all. No two people could ever agree about how any drink tastes. That's just a matter of personal opinion. The most important thing about a whiskey is how old it is. Then you can talk about facts, you see. Whiskey A is two years old and whiskey B is three years old. So everybody buys whiskey B. It's as simple as that. How old is Old Mill Pond? He lowered his voice. Well, just between you and me, it isn't too old. That's why we need some really hot advertising. That's where the dinosaur comes in. But how can a dinosaur make it any older, I said. It doesn't actually make it any older. It makes it seem older. That's the whole secret of advertising, my boy. And that's why the distillers always have pictures of old mills and rocking chairs and grandfathers on their labels. Now, what could be older than a dinosaur? You can't beat it. It's the oldest thing around. If the idea catches on, we might even change the name of our brand to Old Dinosaur or Old Fossil. Or, no, that sounds too dry. Perhaps Old Jurassic. We'll be the oldest sounding drink on the market. We'll make a fortune. But what would you do with the dinosaur, I asked? Oh, we put them on display in the big truck and paint it all up in flashy colors. And the banners on the top, hire a sound truck and tour the country. It'll make Old Mill Pond the best known name in the business. It would be wonderful things for us. I don't think it would be a wonderful thing for the dinosaur. I said, all that racket and moving around would probably make him sick. Don't worry about that, the man said. We'd pay you $200 a month while he lived. He'd last long enough to make a good money out of him. I thought about the $200 a month, but finally I shook my head. I don't guess I better. The man threw up his hands. But what are you going to do with him then? I'm not going to do anything with him. I just want to have him. Isn't it enough just to have something? Not when you can make money on it, the man said. He took a printed car out of the case and gave it to me. Now, when you get tired of just having this dinosaur, let me know, will you? He walked back to his big yellow car and drove away. I think it was just a few days later that a letter came from the McDermott's luggage company. Dear Mr. Twitchell, we were interested to hear that you have come into the possession of a live dinosaur. As you may know, we are manufacturers of fine hand luggage and make specialty of makes a specialty of luggage in a wide variety of unusual feathers leathers, such as buffalo calf, gym stock, baby whale, and iguana. It occurred to us that you might be willing to let us have your dinosaur for this purpose. We assure you that we are prepared to make you a very good offer. There's no other dinosaur hide on the market at present. Sincerely, Edward D. McDermott, president. I didn't like that idea very much. Imagine making Uncle Beasley into a suitcase. It made me shiver just to think of it. 
Well, things went on this way for a week or so with people coming in every now and then, perhaps only about 20 people a day. Some of them had some pretty weird ideas. One man came with one of those tape recorder things and he said he wanted to record the voice of prehistoric time. He spent most of the afternoon trying to get Uncle Beasley to make some sort of noise. The man squeaked and growled and barked and roared at him. Then the man finally got disgusted and said something to himself that I bet he wouldn't want to have recorded. Then he went away. The dinosaur had been growing like anything, and by the middle of August, he was a good five and a half feet long, counting his tail, and about two and a half feet high. He'd gotten too heavy for the kitchen scales when he was five days old, and after that, we had to go to two bathroom scales and lay a plank over them. Then get Uncle Beasley to stand on the plank. We'd read what the two scales said and add them together, and then this and then subtract what the plank weighed. Dr. Zemer's notebook went along like this. August 12th, the length was 5'1", and they weighed, he weighed 106 pounds. August 13th, the length is 5 and three, five feet, 3 and a half inches, weighs 121. August 14th, length 5 foot 6, weighs 144 pounds. You can see that it was really coming right along. The doctor was the most surprised man. He said he'd never known any animal to grow that fast. He used to stand there and puzzle over it while he was watching Uncle Beasley. I know reptiles can grow very fast, he told me. Take alligators, for instance. They can grow to be six feet long in five years, and then when they're big enough to take care of themselves, they slow down. But this fella has grown to almost six feet in two weeks. Of course, the Triceratops was living in an age of big animals, and I suppose they had to grow fast in order to survive, but still, this is unbelievable rate of growth. I wonder, perhaps, the quality of the modern atmosphere is different from what it was 60 million years ago. Perhaps his metabolism has been speeded up. That's just a guess, of course. But anyway, Nate, if he goes along at this rate much longer, we're going to have problems on our hands. Getting food for the dinosaurs was a problem already. I ran out of grass around our place in just a few days. Then I used to go down to the old Spencer place at the end of the street. The grass was just growing wild there around the house into the back lot. Joe Champini would go along with me and we'd take an old express wagon with sides on it. We'd take turns with the scythe and we'd cut enough for one day. We'd pile it on the wagon, tie it on with the clothesline, pull it back to my house. It was hot work, but it was worth it to see old Uncle Beasley plow into a pile of green grass. He just loved to eat. That was all right for a while, but then we found out we had to begin making two trips a day because one load wasn't enough. Joe was beginning to complain that he wasn't getting any time to go fishing anymore, and it shouldn't, and it wouldn't be long before he'd be out of grass at the Spencer place. Pop suggested that we get old Henry Smith to cut us a patch of grass every couple of days with his tractor. Henry Smith mows the sides of the town roads, and so he has his mowing machine out most of the time. That worked pretty well. Dr. Zemer borrowed a trailer for the garage from the garage, and we would hop, we could haul a big pile of grass and dump it in our backyard, and that would be last for two to three days. Of course, by the time the dinosaur was much too much was much too big to keep in that little pen, we had to give that up when he was about a week old. We decided that the only thing to do was to tether him, so we got a strong leather collar and a cow chain and drove a big crowbar into the ground and fastened the chain to that. It worked pretty well and Uncle Beasley didn't seem to mind it at all. He was very friendly with me and never tried to bite or poke at me with his horns. He was kind of nervous with other people though and he did not like loud noises. They seemed to make him angry. Dr. Seymour told me I had to exercise Uncle Beasley every day since he was tied up that way. So I would walk him for, take him for a walk in the mornings. I used to do it before breakfast when it was quiet and cool and we'd walk up the street to the school and back. It felt pretty weird walking along with strange animals shuffling along behind me. His head slowly wagged back and forth and his big tail dragging in the dust. Okay, we'll see how those walks go in chapter 11 next time. We'll see you later.